Tonight, Film On picks up where Aereo left off. A former Amazon worker calls it a prison. And the culture clash between car makers and Google over self-driving cars. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 119 for Monday, June 30th, 2014. Hi, I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into the tech feed. In the wake of last week's Supreme Court ruling that barred streaming service Aereo from operating without a license, streaming TV and movie service Film On has reclassified itself as a cable company. Today, the company announced a new paid streaming package in 18 cities across the U.S. that allows viewers to watch broadcast channels such as ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox on either their computers or their mobile devices. Film On's founder, Alki Davis, David is responding to the Supreme Court's finding that services like Filmon and Aereo are basically cable companies. Now, ideally, broadcasters will now treat Filmon as a cable company and allow it to use their signals in exchange for a fair royalty payment. In order to qualify as a cable company, Filmon claims it just needs to charge its subscribers, which is what the company started to do today. The technology is what Filmon calls a teleporter. And I'm just going to go ahead and say it's a safe bet that the broadcasters will not be thrilled. The Supreme Court also has announced that it will not consider Google's challenge to a class action lawsuit alleging that the search giant violated federal wiretap laws when its street view cars collected data from private Wi-Fi networks back in 2010. The lawsuit followed admissions by Google that, yes, its street view cars did collect payload data that was being sent on unsecured Wi-Fi networks when the cars drove by. Data included emails, usernames, and passwords that are sent over the internet. Now, Google acknowledged that this data collection did occur, said it was an accident, but the class action lawsuit, which was filed on behalf of individuals whose information was collected, alleged that Google violated the Federal Wiretap Act, which bars the interception of electronic communications. Ever feel like your smartphone is just not really private enough? The black phone might appeal to you then. It's the product of SGP Technologies, a joint venture between the cryptographic service Silent Circle and the specialty mobile hardware manufacturer Geek's Phone. It's the first consumer-grade smartphone to be built explicitly for privacy and start shipping to customers who pre-ordered it this week. Black Phone's operating system is the private OS, which gives a user a higher degree of control over what apps are running on the phone and what they can access and what they can do. Pre-installed applications on the phone are focused on keeping conversations and searches and all app data private, as well as preventing Wi-Fi attacks and data harvesting when the phone is being used out and about in the wild. The services bundled in include a two-year subscription to Silent Circle's voice, video, and text services, three one-year friend and family Silent Circle subscriptions that allow others to install the service on their existing smartphones, Two years of one gigabyte per month disconnect virtual private network service, disconnects anonymizing search, and two years of Spider Oak cloud file storage and sharing with a limit of five gigabytes per month. And for even more specs, and there are more, Ars Technica has a great hands-on review. A new documentary about Amazon called Amazon Rising premiered last night on cable network CNBC and explores worker conditions at Amazon's warehouses and claims from some former workers, that the company steals business from its partners who sell goods on its marketplace. One former worker interviewed for the documentary said, quote, I felt like Amazon was a prison. She also reported tough working conditions. CNBC said it spoke to more than 100 independent businesses, all who sell their wares through Amazon's market. Two dozen of them claimed that Amazon attempted to ink separate deals with suppliers to purchase the same goods that the merchant sells then compete directly with them on Amazon.com. Google Glass was introduced to the UK just about two weeks ago, and already the Independent is reporting that movie theaters will be banning them. During movies, anyway. Among the theaters that will ban glass are the View Cinema Chain. They'll ask guests to take off glass when the lights dim. Leicester Square Cinema, which has already previously asked a glass explorer to take them off. In the U.S., though, the Alamo Draft Cinema and the Five Point Cafe, which is based in Seattle, also have publicly banned Google Glass. Google has asked cinemas and restaurants to try Google Glass themselves before instituting any policies. 
You know, while we're on the Google subject, uh, let's talk about some other stuff. The company will shut down its social networking service, Orkut, on September 30th of this year. As a user, you can export your profile data, community posts, and photos using Google Takeout. That'll be available uh, through September of 2016. Starting today, though, you cannot create a new Orkut account. That's not all, though. Google's also killing Quick Office, at least in its current state. That's sort of its Microsoft Office company compatible productivity app uh, that runs on Android and iOS. The Google team says that existing users with the app can continue to use it, but no features will be added and new users will not be able to install the app. The company says it's integrated Quick Office's Office document compatibility layer into its separate docs, its separate docs, sheets, and slides app. One of them is called Docs. Coming up, the first ever social network that's all emoji. Yeah, it's Pretty fun. But first, let's talk to Chris Davies. He's the executive editor over at Slash Gear. Hey, Chris, welcome to TN2. Hey, thanks for having me. Well, it's very nice to have you. All right, so let's talk about an article uh, that went up on Slash Gear today that Google's arrogant self-driving car is turning off automakers. Now, is this because the automakers, for the most part, are legacy companies and things don't move as slowly as they would in the Google universe? As, as quickly, Google rather? <laughs> I think Google certainly does move quickly. I would argue that maybe the, the automotive companies aren't necessarily legacy. I think that's a little unfair, perhaps. They don't move with the same uh, speed that, uh, say, your smartphone does. But then again, your smartphone doesn't tend to move at the same speed on the highway as, as your phone might. So this is something that we need to get really right if we want to uh, have autonomous self-driving cars on the roads and for them to not be a, a significant safety issue. As as a as a car company, uh, obviously mm -hmm. uh, always innovating. Uh, that's that's sort of the point. Um, and car makers have historically competed with each other. When you have, bring Google into the mix, does it change? How does it change the dynamic for how the companies are innovating? Are they forced to work with Google? Does it now turn into a situation where you don't want to rely too much on Google? What do you think the What do you think the next step is? I think. Google is one of those names that uh, represents uh, an awful lot of um, heft in any industry that it wades into. And I think the, the car companies have clearly looked at uh, what Google's self-driving work represents and are perhaps a little wary and uncertain about how that might affect their business. You know, an awful lot of them are, are looking at their own autonomous self-driving car projects. Uh, Volvo is working on one, Mercedes-Benz sent one across Germany recently. Um, so these are all projects that are kind of ongoing. Um, the question is, how much do the manufacturers want to work with Google on them? And, and to what extent will Google demand control over the system? I think the fear there is that by allowing Google in through the door, that it's going to end up as something like a Nexus project, um, the equivalent for um, for cars rather than for phones and tablets, where the manufacturers get sidelined and are expected just to deliver the hardware on which it's Google's platform for autonomous vehicles, which gets all the attention. Google's a pretty powerful company. Do you think the auto manufacturers are in danger of of sort of buying into an ecosystem that you could think of it almost like Android for cars, where it's something that uh, they 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 have to play along with? I think there are going to be multiple options when it comes to self driving. I think we're going to see a variety of different approaches to it. Uh, there are an awful lot of issues still remaining. You know, Google's announced that it will be putting out this fleet of little pod cars, as you showed in the video just before. It's going to be a very limited trial. You know, they're talking about 100 to 200 of those vehicles. They're limited to 25 miles per hour. The, the actual areas in which they can drive, very much dependent on where Google has high definition kind of mapping for, you know, which is more than you would find, more details than you would find on, say, a regular Google Maps search if you were looking for any city across the globe. So there are, there are a lot of issues which will slow Google down if that's if they decide to go it alone. I think it's it comes as no great surprise that they're looking for a, a partnership opportunity with, with other manufacturers. I think the, the question is how much control, how much of that partnership um, are the car companies willing to give up to Google? How, how involved do they want to be with Google or how much do they want to do it themselves at their own pace? There's a technical issue here, uh, what the best technology is and how we can all be safe. What about the liability issue? Uh, obviously, there is there is some question as to who would be at fault if something happened with a self-driving car, and if, if 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 Google and a car manufacturer are working together, well, who gets the blame in that situation? It's a really good question. It's one that nobody in the industry has really answered yet. 
you know, there's everything from if the car stops responding, well, you know, whose responsibility is that? If if the car is intelligent enough to see that it's going to have a crash, uh, does who's you know where is the responsibility that the car decides? Does it decide that the the driver is more important than a pedestrian on the side of the road? And how about if there are two pedestrians or two people in the car? And where does it kind of balance that? Uh, that decision-making process on who is who deserves to be saved and who is put at risk. I think there are an awful lot of issues around safety and which are, I think are going to lead to a very limited trial, perhaps initially when we see these. We're going to see them on the roads. I think that's a given. I think we're going to see them in very limited scenarios initially, which will put them into kind of a safe environment away from the general road traffic use. Chris Davies is the executive editor over at Slash Gear. Chris, I just hope all of this doesn't mean that I have to wait longer for my self-driving car because driving is the I hope best. so, too. <laughs> it, it really is. Yeah, I, <laughs> I can't wait for it myself. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for joining us. And before you go, tell folks where they can keep up with your work at Slash Gear and online. Oh, you can find us on slashgear.com or on Twitter. Uh, it's Slash Gear. And I'm uh, on Twitter as well, C underscore Davis, I believe it says so. Just down Right there. under you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Glad we spelled that right. Thanks so much for being here, Chris. Thanks for having me, Sarah. All right. Finally, if you like expressing yourself via emoji, you know what emojis are, right? Then you'll love Emojly. I'm not even kidding. This is a real thing. It's a social network launching soon that is completely emoji based from usernames to status updates to whatever else you might talk about via emoji. The creators of Emojly claim that there won't be any spam because there isn't even an emoji for spam, unless you count the emoji for poop, which I guess could be spam-like or just funny. Emojily will launch on iOS soon and will make its way to other platforms in the next year. If you want to reserve your username, which of course can only be in emoji, you can go over to Emoji's launch page. We will have a link in our show notes as well. By the way, I can't not do participate in things like this, so if you're looking for me, I have already reserved my username. I am Crown, smiling cat with heart eyes, Crown. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. I'm serious, I'm not kidding. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write us with feedback, questions, and comments at TN2 at twit.tv. And don't miss Tech News today. That's our morning newscast. It's tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane, and thanks for watching. And listening. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.